As Christians, we can say to God, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path because the word of God is the living energy that actively provides illumination, insight, direction, guidance for a journey through a dark and sinful world. For example, what different Bible verses in Old Testament and New Testament say, the just shall live by faith. Habakkuk 2 4. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him. Romans 1 17. For therein is the righteous of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Galatians 3.11, Galatians 3.11, but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident for the just shall live by faith. And finally, Hebrews 10, Hebrews 10, 38. Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall no shall have no pleasure in him. And expected when God repeats himself well four times, he must be stopped talking about something serious. As we all know, faith is serious business. Now furthermore, the Bible also says that we have all been given a measure of faith. Romans 12, 3, Romans 12, 3, um, says, For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to, to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one measure of faith. The verse is a reminder that faith is a gift from God, so that no one can boast. When a person is born again, God gives him or her gifts as a member of the family of God. God has given to each and every one of us a measure of faith to use for him. We receive the gifts according to the measure of faith God has given to each of us. And we exercise the gifts according to the same measure of faith. The bottom line is that we are all, we all sat at the same level. However, where we end up is a different matter as we shall see. That is the reason why the apostles prayed and we also, we also need to pray the same prayer. And the prayer is increase my faith. So let us pray this morning. Increase my faith, O Lord. Increase my faith, O Lord. Thank you, Lord, for my faith. Sustain it. Strengthen it, strengthen it. Don't let it fail. Don't let it fall. Make it the power of my life so that I, in everything I do, you get the glory as the greatest giver. Father, the word says I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Give me your strength, O Lord. Give me your strength. Not physical strength, but the power to move mountains that flow from faith in Jesus. Help me to depend on you to do what we think help us to, to depend on you to do what we think we cannot do. Let your strength alone, let your strength alone sustain us. Build up our faith, O Lord. Build up our faith. Increase our faith to depend on you entirely for every day, not just not on things of this world, for our strength and abilities. Not a single day can be added to our life through worry. And our Heavenly Father, you know what we need and you provide for all our cares. Help us to trust you more. Help us to trust you more. For you care for each and every one of us. Father, increase our faith to make us movers of mountains. Father, increase our faith to make us movers of mountains. Go out to live in you alone. So that we will be strong in you and always be ready to battle against the doubts planted by the enemy. Thank you, Father God. In Jesus' name we are praying. Amen.
Again, welcome to our service this morning. This month we are being confronting, confronting the powers challenging our dominion. And this morning, uh, there's no exception, we're going to be focusing on faith, the faith to confront powers challenging our dominion. In other words, how do we go from unbelief to strong faith? How do we go from unbelief to strong faith? Just like the, pa- the father, just like the father of the demon possessed the boy in the book of Mark, uh, Jesus said to him, everything is possible for one who believes. Everything is possible for one who believes. And immediately the father, the boy's father exclaimed that, I do believe, help me to overcome my own belief. I do believe, help me to overcome my own belief. So please, Say that with me this morning. I do believe. Help me to overcome my own belief. I do believe, Lord. Help me to overcome my own belief. Amen. There's one person in the Bible that is called the father of faith and the friend of God. And we all know who that person is. The person is Abraham, of course. His original name was Abraham, but today we are going to just call him Abraham. Interestingly enough, his story is our story. Uh, Jesus said in John 6.44, John 6.44, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me to him, and I will raise him up at the last day. <laughs> like Abraham, each and every one of us, at a particular point, the Lord brought our attention so we believe that there is a, there is, there is a true and living God in the midst of this worldly culture around us. The Lord said to each and every one of us, I want you, I want to teach you, I want to teach you about me. So like Abraham, we started out on the journey to know the Lord and call on the name and character of the Lord. As we all know, Abraham was made that righteous with God by faith alone, apart from works. So are we. Abraham was justified by faith when he was still a Gentile, that is, before the covenant of circumcision. So are we, before we knew about raising the blood of Jesus. Therefore, Abraham's faith in God Started similarly to what we all experience today as born again Christians. First, we believe in God. Our salvation begins with faith because we can't receive anything from God except by faith. So today, we will look at the life of prayer. We will look at the life of Abraham, the father of faith, so that our faith will also go stronger as we exercise it. As we exercise our faith, our faith will go stronger. The Bible says in Colossians 2, 7, Let your roots grow down into Him, and let your life be built on Him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth that you were taught, and you will overcome, you will overflow, you will overflow with thankfulness. Now, I build a little bit of an history to help us uh, put the story of Abraham in the right perspective. Now, in the book of Joshua, Joshua uh, 24, verse 2, Joshua said that <clears throat> when God called Abraham from Mesopotamia, uh, Mesopotamia, sorry, or uh, what we would say all of the Chaldeans, <clears throat> We are Abraham's father, uh, Abraham's, Abraham's family, served all the God that is to say many idols. Uh, probably he was a worshiper of the moon. Well, this particular topic was not, spoke, was not covered in the story of Abraham in Genesis. So, uh, according to uh, historians, uh, Abraham's dad, Tehran, was the eighth Generation from Noah's son, Shem. Now, Noah, we all know, knew God, but something happened between the time of Noah, and by the time we get to uh, Abraham, father, Terah, 
that the family became idol worshippers. Okay? How come? What happened? Well, simply put, the older generation before Abraham failed to pass on their beliefs to their children. Now, we know that Noah found free will within the eyes of God, but the knowledge of God faded from generation to generation after that. So, consider this particular quote from the book of Judges, just to give you an idea of what happened. And all the generation that were gathered, and all that generation also were gathered to their fathers. And there arose another generation after them who did not know Lord for the work which that he had done for Israel. Now, this is something that we all need to be aware of, pay attention to, because uh, we need to, we need to shower. We need to shower our children with prayers for salvation. We will know the Almighty God very early in life. Okay, I'm going to repeat that again. We need to shower our children with prayers so that we get to know the Lord very early in life. There's a particular um, saying in the neck of the book that I'm from, and it basically says, Omar Durak is all. English translation is the fact that a child that you raise on fervent prayer or pray over fervently will not be lost. And in the mighty name of Jesus, our fervent prayer for our children will be answered expressly in Jesus' name. We all need to remember though that just like Abraham, we need to be intentional in passing our faith to the next generation. Now, you may be wondering, why did God pick an idol worshiper to serve him? Why did God pick an idol worshiper, Abraham, to serve him? Perhaps Abraham found favor with God because of the blessings that Noah placed upon his son Shem. Because Abraham is from the lineage of Shem. And one of the blessings that Abraham uh, spoke over Shem was the fact that he will receive the greatest blessings. <clears throat> now, whenever, whenever God makes a promise, it is irrevocable. Whenever God makes a promise, it is irrevocable. So, when God decided to pick Abraham, whatever, it must be because of something like that. And, and by extension, each and every one of us sitting in this room today, Something must have happened in the past that made it possible for us to God, for, for God to call each and every one of us. So that's what I'm trying to make sure we understand. The fact that you're sitting in this room this morning because of something somebody in the past did that God paid attention to to make sure that you get to know him. That's the point I'm trying to make. Now, the point again that we also need to be aware of is the fact that just like Abraham was called by God. Uh, God, just like he started all the way again with Noah, God was starting all the way again with Abraham. He said, okay, I'm going to start again because the generation of Abraham didn't last for too long. They all became idol worshippers. So God decided, okay, I'm going to pick somebody else. And they picked Abraham. And the goal again is to make sure that God is trying to recover mankind from our sinful nature. Okay, just like each and every one of us is called, we have a mission. The mission is the fact that we have to continue following God to make sure that the mankind, that mankind is saved. Okay, God is calling each and every one of us and He's telling each and every one of us, I want to teach you about me. The question is, are we listening? Okay. Are we listening? If we don't listen to God, God will pick somebody else. That's the point I'm trying to make. Okay, in Genesis 12, too much for history. In Genesis 12, we're going to read verse 1, and then we're going to read verses 4 through 7 from the New King James Version. <clears throat> now the Lord has said to Abraham, Get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to the land I will show you. So Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and God went to him. And Abraham was 75 years old when he departed from Aaron. Then Abraham, Abraham took his wife, uh, took his wife's 
um, to Sarah, his wife, and Lord, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people whom they had acquired in Aaron, and they departed to the land of Canaan. So they came to the land of Canaan, Abraham passed to the land to the place of Shechem, as far as the terrible tree of Moray. And the Canaanites were in the land, then the Lord appeared to Abraham and said to him, To your descendants I will give this land, and there he built an altar to the Lord who appeared to him. May the Lord bless the reading, bless the reader and the hearers of his word. In Jesus' name. Amen. Two points I want to make from the verses I just read. <clears throat> now, Genesis 1 says, Now the Lord has said to Abraham, O Abraham, uh, it, it, it implies that this was not the first time that God spoke to him. Because he said, Now the Lord has said to Abraham. The point I'm trying to make is the fact that if you read the account of Deacon Stephen in the book of Acts, he said that God uh, called Abraham in the call of the Chaldeans. So the call that we read about in Genesis 12 is actually the second call. That's the point I want to make. Now you probably wonder how come he was called twice. Okay? What happened the first time he was called? Well, if you look at Genesis 11, you will see there that the Account in Genesis 11 talked about the father of Abraham, Terran, leaving uh, the court of the Chaldeans to go to Haran. Uh, Haran. So, in, in essence, the point I'm trying to make is the fact that the obedience of Abraham is not as immediate as we all think. Okay, so when, when God spoke to him, Yes, he decided to do something, but basically he was influenced by that. So everybody left with him. And when they got to Aaron, of course, then the dad said, I'm not going anymore. And they stayed there until the father died. And then Abraham continued the journey to where God sent him. Okay? Partial obedience is a point I want to make. Partial obedience is not the same thing as obedience. Okay, we need to watch out for that. So when God says jump, you don't say I'm going to jump halfway and you have to jump all the way. Okay. Okay. Now, uh, fortunately, of course, Abraham did not make the same mistake when God asked him to sacrifice Isaac. He left without telling his wife. So uh, another case in point that I also want to make is the fact that a uh, few people are called but very few, a lot of people are called, very few are chosen. A lot of people are called, uh, very few people are chosen. Now, again, it depends on each and every one of us to decide whether we want to be called or whether we want to be chosen. So, in the mighty name of Jesus, my prayer is the fact that everyone wants to be chosen in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. The other point I want to make from the verses that we read is the fact that uh, we met two men, actually three, but two I want to focus on is, uh, Abraham and Lot. Abraham and Lot. As we read further down, we see that there's a separation eventually between the two of them. And the one reason there's a separation between the two of them, as you continue to read about the account, is the fact that Abraham loved to build altars to God. We didn't read any, we didn't read any account of where Lot actually built an altar. Okay. So, yeah, you will see that they all ended up in two different ways. We, we saw that Abraham continued to build altars to God, whereas, uh, Lot was, uh, more influenced by ambition and wealth and things of that nature and he decided to go after uh, Sodom and Gomorrah instead. So, the point I'm trying to make is the fact that anyone who is too busy to pray is on the dangerous highway of pride and self-sufficiency. And that will not be a portion of the Amen. Now, what is faith? I'm sure we all have no definition of faith. What is faith? Uh, Hebrews 11, 11 says, Now faith is confident in what we hope for, an assurance of what we do not see. 
So biblical faith represents or looks at present day position, uh, things that are not yet seen through the eyes of, of, of hope in the future. Now, what God has revealed in His Word becomes the reality that we, we hold on to. If God says, This is what I'm going to do for you, that is our hope. That is our reality. So we look at the world through the lens of God promises, not what we actually see. So faith is and always has been the means of salvation. The Bible teaches that faith, okay, faith is not just a mental attitude. As we read in the book of James, that says, saving faith is revealed by a person's action. Our good works are proof that our faith is alive. Therefore, faith without works is dead. Okay. What is an altar? In the broadest sense, an altar is a designated place where a person concentrate and concentrates himself or herself to something. Okay. Many church buildings have altars, as we all know, for prayer, communion, weddings, and on and on. And on. Individually, we also have altars okay, where we spend quiet time with God on our own. The whole idea is the fact that we are presenting ourselves as a living sacrifice to God. Okay. Now, the most important altar, of course, is our heart. Okay. Every human being has an invisible altar where the war between flesh and the spirit reaches all the time. When we surrender all, when we surrender all to the control of the Holy Spirit, we're basically laying ourselves on an altar before God. An altar before God. So we should surrender our lives to God on an altar of our hearts all the time. Now, as we read about the account, account of Abraham, you will see that he built four different altars. Four different altars. And those altars are very significant. And that's what I want to spend most of the time on the type of altar that Abraham built because that's an example of how we can develop our own faith also. Okay. Now we will also read also uh verses in chapter eleven that we read during the during the uh, Bible reading to be able to see that the four altars that we're going to read about also corresponds to different verses in Hebrew, which I want to mention, that ties to each of the altars that Abraham built. But again, it's a way of just letting us know that the Bible as a whole, the Old Testament, New Testament, are basically saying the same thing to help us understand what faith is all about. Now, the first altar that Abraham built was when he arrived at uh, the land of Canaan. And the Bible, uh, the, the, the Hebrew, Hebrew um, 11, 8 says that uh, by faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go to the place where he would receive the inheritance. So he went, not knowing where he was going. This is the altar of obedience. This is the altar of obedience. So the first altar that we all have to build is the altar of obedience. Our obedience will be complete. Our obedience will be complete to God. So again, having lingered a little bit, and we talked about this in current, eventually ended up in the land of Canaan. Now, one of the things, of course, when we look at that a little bit, we see that uh, Abraham's obedience is an example for each and every one of us today that when we, are, when we believe in Jesus Christ, when we believe in Jesus Christ, we actually have to do something. We have to follow him wholeheartedly. Unlike the unbelievers that are sons of disobedience, we are children of obedience. We are children of obedience. The other thing I also want to point out is the fact that the place of spiritual blessing, the promised land, is not heaven immediately. God didn't take us out of here and say, go to heaven. He left us here for a reason. He left each and every one of us here for a reason. Just like he took Abraham from somewhere 
to the land, the promised land. But you remember the promised land, the Canaanite was still there. The idol was there. So in which case, just like we are today, right? we live in the world, right? we live in the world of craziness. God didn't take us out of here for a reason. He wants us to be able to represent him in this particular world. We know that yes, it's crazy, but us, that's how we build our horses, so to speak. When you can stand in front of an unsolved of hell, definitely you can stand in here. And that's one of the reasons why we are still here. We, it is a guarantee that we will find our blessings in this environment. But we have to stand. We will find our blessings. Just like, just like, uh, Abraham went to uh, the Canaan land, but he, what he saw wasn't what God wanted him to be. God wanted him to be something else. But so he has to stand in that environment. Be able to say, I represent you that, and I'm going to represent you very well. So, again, the author of the book, Hebrew said that through him, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. So, regardless of what you praise, regardless of what you're going through, that is the reason for the altar of obedience to continuously offer sacrifice of praise to God. The second altar that Abraham built is mentioned in Genesis 2, 8 and 9 that says he moved from there onto a, a mountain on the east side of Bethlehem which is in Avon Bethel on the west and Ai of I on the east and there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. So Abraham journeyed, going on still toward the south. Uh, this altar is what I call the altar of faith work. We all have to walk through this world by faith. So in the land of promise, which is a, 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 a strange land, a strange country, just as we're here on this earth, which is strange, it, we are, so we are here to be able to build our muscles and use the opportunity to represent God. So basically what I'm trying to say is the fact that there are three things we need to be aware of. We are to abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. Number two, we are admonished not to love this world, neither the things that are in this world. Okay, and number three, of course, we should be mindful of the, the truth that through this world, is not our hope. This world is not our hope. So again, we are in this world, we are not of this world. But it's in this world that we build the muscle to be able to stand for God. Because again, that's the reason why we're not taken to heaven immediately. We are supposed to be here to represent God. Okay, now, uh, the Bible also recorded after that there came a great, a great famine in the land. And Abraham did an ask God, he decided to go to Europe, Egypt. Okay. <laughs> he decided to go to Egypt. Now, usually people say, well, you're hungry, you go to Egypt. Okay. <laughs> okay. Because we all, we we're always looking for a way out. Anyway, sometimes, even in the case of Abraham, he didn't ask God, God, what do I do? So he just went to Egypt. Now, of course, when he was going to Egypt, he had to compromise. He said, okay, tell them my wife, uh, don't tell them you're my wife. Tell them that you're my sister. Or we all know the story. Anyway. So, we think, but by his mercy, God was with him, and he was able to survive Egypt and got out of Egypt with a lot of stuff. Okay. God is in his infinite mercy can use a bad situation to make something good out of it. The point I'm trying to make is the fact that we all, we're not going to be perfect. When we do something wrong, just like Abraham did, he repented and he experienced God's forgiveness. Okay. So keep that in mind. Nobody is perfect. Even Abraham wasn't perfect. And of course, we will never be perfect. Okay. We will make mistakes along the way, but God in his infinite mercy is always watching for us to help us out. Okay. After, of course, when, um, when Abraham returned from Egypt, he went back to the altar that he built. And at that particular altar is where we independent and 
experience that forgiveness. Again, don't forget your altar. Don't forget your altar. The altar is there for you to always go back to God and let God know, hey, I made a mistake. I'm, I, I'm back again. Now, one of the other things also happened when you came back from Egypt. They prospered a lot. Lot was prosperous. Abraham was very prosperous. And this is, in my opinion, God's doing because God wants Abraham to separate from Lot. Okay. When they got too big to be able to be together, the, the, the headman started fighting and eventually Abraham said, okay, Lot, okay, you, you gotta go. Pick, pick whatever you want. I'll do something else. Okay. And of course, remember we said earlier that Lot was not built in altars. So he has no, no, and he knows about God, of course, but he has no personal relationship with God. That's the point I'm trying to say. And here, if you read the Bible, God, the Bible says, Lot was righteous. But his righteousness was not based on, um, the, uh, a firm relationship with God. So anyway, they had to separate. After they separated, of course, uh, Abraham built another altar. Okay. And this is the altar of separation. That's another altar that we all have to build. In which case, there comes a time that you're going to say, okay, it's you and me, God, nothing else. Okay. Because we notice that what Abraham did was the fact that he separated himself from God and he went somewhere else where he can spend time with God. He can spend time with God. He forgo, he, for, uh, he didn't go with uh, the, the Sodom and Gomorrah. He went somewhere very quiet in Hebron. Uh, he desired to, be se- to separate himself from God instead of the worldly uh, thing that he was able to see in the land of Canaan. Now, the man of God desired, desired that no city here on earth because he looked for the city whose builder and maker is God, according to the book of Hebrews. Okay, so the, 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 the whole idea is the fact that just like, uh, just like it's mentioned in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews 11, 16, it says that, but now they desire a better that is a, a a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Again, the point is the fact that they were not looking at here on earth. Their focus was somewhere else. And that's some of the, one of the things that we all have to remember also. Our focus should not be here. Even if you spend 200 years on earth, compared to eternity, it's nothing. Okay? It's nothing. So the focus of Abraham all along was on God, on what God is going to do, on the promises of God. Okay, that's the reason why. Uh, that's the reason why we we all need to we all need to be aware of that. That in this age, as in every age, we are all basically on a on a pilgrim, on a pilgrim. And, it, uh, and just a sojourner in this world. Uh, we are here to separate ourselves. We are here uh, to get away from the world system of greed and self-promotion and lustful lifestyle and all the stuff that has to do with this world. Because through the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, we are crucified to this world and consider ourselves dead to his attractions and involvement. Okay. We are again also to be separated from man-made religious system. You know how we go with right with uh, man-made religious system. Okay. Uh, so again, it, it's feeling when you look at what the book of Hebrews says, if you look at the Hebrews uh, 13, verses 13 and 14. Therefore, let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach, for we have no Continuing city, and we see the one to come. Uh, focus is not here. What we want is not here. We know God is building a new Jerusalem, and that's where we want to be. So our focus, yes, we are here for now. But just that like we learned from Abraham, our focus is not supposed to be. That doesn't mean you should make a name. Don't get me wrong. 
But we should seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else will be added unto us. Because again, that economy is different from this world economy. Anyway. Okay, the fourth altar, we all know about the fourth altar that Abraham built, which is the altar of sacrifice. We all know that I called him one day and said, hey, Abraham, do you know that son that you love so much? I want you to go and sacrifice him again on the mountain that I'll show you. And we all know the story. Uh, Abraham built an altar on Mount Moriah to offer his only be- beloved son to God. His son was to be an offering on the altar. And Abraham, by faith, obeyed that command to offer his son of promise Isaac. And we all read about this already, that Hebrews 11, 17 to 19, by faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had repented that, and he that had received the promise Offered up his only begotten son, accounting that God was able to raise it. God was able to raise it. Uh, this statement corresponds, of course, to what we see in the book of Genesis. The, the, and it's called the, we call it, of course, the altar of sacrifice, foreshadowing what happened with the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. Now, Abraham's faith was, as we all know, was, um, sorely tested. But he never wavered. He never wavered because he believed that God was able to raise him from the dead. Again, his focus was different, and that's one of the things I all, all want us to gain from this experience. That if if you know God's promises for your life, that should be your focus, not what you are to see, as we talked about before. Now, of course, this is a very uh, uh, gut-wrenching, heart-wrenching experience for for Abraham. Okay, but uh, he was able to he was able to go through it, especially when Isaac was asking him. Okay, uh, I I know something about offering. Okay, I saw the uh, I saw I saw all the things that you prepare for. Where's an arm that we're going to use for offering? So, in which case that Isaac was not a dummy. Okay. <laughs> He knew exactly what's going on. Okay? But he, he didn't, he didn't really resist. Well, he didn't run away from his act. Okay, that, that's another interesting fact. That, uh, 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 which is the reason why I think that also God has a, a place, a heart for Isaac also, because he knew what was going on. And instead of running away from him, he, he went along with him. Anyway, that's, uh, that's something we also need to, to think about because again, most of the situations that we go through in life has something to do with our learning process, our learning process of getting to know what God is. Okay. And in this particular case, I think also learned something about God because we know how the story ended. Anyway, we know God will not ask himself to do something that he himself will not do. And we also know that he gave his son, Jesus, for each and every one of us. And actually, Jesus had to went through, went through the process of actually dying and being raised again. Okay, and being raised again. Now, for us today, for us today, the couple of questions I want to think about. Okay, the question is whether we can thoroughly trust our God in all circumstances of life. Can we thoroughly trust God? No circumstances of life. Now we may not be subjected to the same thing that Abraham went through, but the question is this: Whatever God is asking you to do, are you willing to do it without questioning God? Without saying no. Okay. And we talked about the four altars that Abraham went to, the altar of obedience. That has to be number one. We have to get to a point whereby we obey God completely. We can obey God partially without to obey God completely. We also talked about the altar of um, of work of faith. Work of faith requires praying and worship all the time. You're not going to understand what God is doing with you, but you have to trust God every step of the way which is the key about 
praising God and worshiping God all the time when you don't really even understand what is going on. Okay. So that's the second order we need to also think about and make sure that we are aware of that. The third author we talked about is your separation unto God the Lord. There comes a time when you have to say, okay, I don't understand what is going on, but I made up my mind I'm not going backwards. I am going to stick with God no matter what. And that's the altar of, uh, of separation unto God. And then finally, the altar that we talked about is, is the altar of living sacrifice. That says, okay, I made up my mind, it's God or nothing. I'm a living sacrifice for God no matter what happens. And we see in the example of Abraham, he went through all these experiences, he went through all these experiences in his, in his own life. Uh, and day by day, when you get to uh, Romans uh, 4, verses 19 and 21, the Bible says, And not being weak in faith, he, Abraham, did not consider his own body already dead, since he was about a hundred years old, or the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was able to perform. That is the level that we also report, that no matter what you're going through, no matter what you see, you hold on to the promise of God, because God is faithful. Now, in order to live by faith, which is basically what we learn from the life of Abraham, it starts by building an altar. It starts by building an altar of obedience. Uh, it starts by uh, building an altar of work of faith. It starts by um, building an altar of separation. It starts by building an altar of total surrender. It is when we do all these things that we can see that uh, uh, we are living by faith. Because we all know what James said, faith without works is what there. So if you don't actively do something, then you don't act, you are not exercising your faith. If you're not actively building an altar, if you're not actively serving God, if you're not actively doing something with God, your relationship with God, moving to another level, okay, then you are not living by faith. That is the point I want to leave us with today. Again, God is going to bless us. The question is, are we making what God is, has given us an idol now and forgetting about the giver? Okay, are we making what God has given us an idol? That we are more concerned about what God has given us, uh, instead of looking at God. Okay, that's another thing we need to be aware of. Now, of course, we live in a world where people are going to say, you guys want to squint. Okay, you go to church on Friday, you go to church on Sunday, you go to church on Wednesday, or whatever. Okay, you must be crazy. I mean, it can't be that difficult. I mean, you, you only need to go to church once a week or something like that. But well, remember now we all Jesus freak. Okay. <laughs> okay. And, and that's what it's going to take. That's the reason why I'm bringing this point up. Okay. Yeah. The appearance of God as the back of our pastor was to tell us over and over again. When you meet Jesus, something was changing your life. If nothing changed in your life after meeting Jesus, you needed, you did not meet Jesus. Okay. Because if you meet Jesus, Something has to change, and I want to. Uh, I want to kind of start wrapping up anyway. There's one particular Bible verse that I want everybody to make a note of. That this is Exodus twenty twenty four. Exodus twenty twenty four. That says, "An altar on earth you shall make for me, and you shall sacrifice on it your burnt offering and your peace offering, your sheep and your oxen." All that is Old Testament. So just say, "Sacrifice yourself." Okay. And every place where I record my name, I will come to you and I will bless you. That is the promise to God. Each and every one of us will come and bless us. He will come 
and bless us. But we have to pitch our tent closer to God, build an altar, keep rebuilding the altar until we get to the point. That, uh, and I remember, the, the, we, we all remember the story of uh, Isaiah, that eventually God appeared to him. And then uh, God, uh, he went through the experience of meeting God or seeing God as who God is. And eventually God asked him the questions. And he says, who should I send? Who should I send? Who should I send? And Isaiah said, send me. Okay. And I'm sure each and every one of us in this room, the closer we walk with God, there will come a time that God is going to say, who should I send? And the question is, are you going to say, send me? Are you going to say, send somebody else? <laughs> okay. Think about that. Anyway, because the question is going to come someday for each and every one of us. I want you to do something for me. Are you ready? And then the question is, are you going to say yes, are you ready? Or are you going to say, oh God, I'm sorry, send somebody else. So on that note, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to pray. We're going to pray. Before we pray again, I just want to remember, I want to remember the altars that Abraham built. Obedience, uh, faith walk, okay, um, separation, again, total surrender, living sacrifice.